Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for joining. And uh, I hope everybody is doing well out there. I'm really looking forward to today's show. We're going to be talking to Dr. Luther, as well as Stella, who does the makeup behind the scenes at AEW. So let's not wait. Let's bring them on right away. Please welcome my guest, Dr. Luther. What's up, my brother? Hello, Dr. Luther. It's, uh, it's good to see you. Always good to see you, and it looks nice and sunny and delicious there. Are you in Canada right now? I am in Portland, Oregon. You're in Portland. I finally decided not to rain, but it is a little bit cloudy. Well, hopefully the rain holds off so you can stay outside for this interview. It's, uh, it's been a while. Uh, I'm getting a call here, so I need to decline that problems with doing this from the cell phone and uh now i get to see your face again what have you been up to for the past I, it's been about seven weeks i think now yes well you what know you I've been, been, are you staying busy staying in quarantine uh like we're supposed to doing my part to uh, um help out everything um trying to work out as best i can um i wasn't are you doing like weird makeshift rocky four type workouts I, I, I am. I call them my prison workouts, but um, it's because I have like one 20 pound dumbbell and a band. So, you know, I'm doing the best that I can do. I feel um, you. Yeah. The band goes a long way. The band does go a long way. I did have uh, a pull up thing. I was using um, my porch awning for doing some pull ups and leg raises, but then I noticed that that's not a good idea after a while. So I had to take that out of the routine. <laughs> well, at least you still have your band and your one dumbbell. I got my band, I got my dumbbell. Uh, so doing lots of boxing stuff. Uh, YouTube is really good, getting some good ideas too. And, um, you know, we just do, you just do your best and, and make it through. This is all gonna blow over soon and we'll be back to normal and we'll hit it up. Get back to the fun days of AEW that we all enjoy so much. Um, speaking of AEW, I would love to hear your story because I remember reading about you in the, I want to say the After Magazines, you know, the, the pro, uh, pro Wrestling Illustrated. And I just remember reading about you and seeing pictures of you. And then when I got to meet at AEW, I thought, oh, this is cool. I, I've seen a lot of you. And we've never crossed paths before, uh, but I don't know your full story, and I would love to hear it because we've never sat down and discussed. So this is a good time to do it with uh, everybody else listening in. Well, it's been a long, uh, long road to get here. That's for sure. Um, I didn't take the direct route, uh, or was lucky enough, or right place to get in. Like some of these guys have it, um, they don't know how great they're going to have it. And, and, in 15 years, they're going to be like, wow, that was crazy. But um, this is crazy, too. And it, 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 one thing, it just shows, like, if people have a goal or have a vision, don't stop. Don't listen to other people. Don't listen to all the um, – the, the, don't take all the bad vibes in. Stay your course, um, and things will work out. Like, it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. But if you st stick, to your, stick to it, you're going to make, you're, you'll make it. Um, How long has your journey been going on? I've been wrestling for 33 years. 33 so, years, wow. Longer than probably half the crew's been alive. Uh, <laughs> but that's all good. Um, I'm there now. That's all that really matters. You made it. Um, and there's no better and, place and, to be. And age doesn't really mean anything. Uh, look at a lot of the top guys in our company are old, older. I guess. Don't really want to say older, but you know what I mean. Um, veterans. Uh, and, and that, you know, it, it's good and I think it's great. That's one thing AEW does. It, they have a good mixture of everything. Um, they got the, the young, all the young talent and they got some veterans to help teach them along the way. And um, I kind of look at myself as, as doing that, as helping out people one way or another however i can do it uh well you have so much experience you've you know it, it's taken you all these years to get to this level but you have so mm -hmm. many years of incredible experience 
working in Japan, working all over the world. I'll let you talk about what you've done, but let's talk about how your journey started. What uh, what made you interested in professional wrestling? I'm guessing as like a kid. It, like everybody as a kid, I grew up in Canada, in Calgary, and I mean, your options or what you want to do when you're a kid is be a pro hockey player and play in the NHL or be a pro wrestler. Um, and I did both. Uh, I played hockey up to, to the junior junior level when I got there. Then I had kind of had to make a choice, like which one am I going to put fully my time into? And so I went into wrestling. Um, I started training when I was about 16, you know, just sort of, I want to call it dabbling because it wasn't like fully invested, obviously. Um, but at 17, I, I went into it fully. Um, trained with the Harts, with Keith Hart. Um, you know, the famous Hart family in Calgary. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, trained there for a long time. Had my was first it just Keith there? Or did any of the brothers pop in? Um, Keith, Keith was the main one. I trained with Owen a couple times when I was in Stampede. That's where I broke in with Stampede Wrestling. Um, and Ross Hart was there. Bruce Hart's there. Um, but I I was awesome. really just with, with Keith Hart mostly, so uh, got stretched quite a bit. Stu would stretch you quite a bit. I, I got stretched by Stu on more than one occasion. Uh, it, he'll usually always walk up to you when you're least expecting it and want to like feel your bicep. That's the big thing. Was you? <laughs> oh, you're a big guy. Uh, and then next thing you know, you're you're wrapped up. <laughs> uh, uh, he's like an anaconda but it, it was wow. pretty cool um even then i knew it was special you know i knew that was like a special thing back then especially as a kid and you really like when i grew up we had i'm gonna this is where i age myself like we had three channels really two but a third one that kind of would come in on my tv um i grew up on a farm so we didn't get the best reception on everything but um we we only got Stampede Wrestling, so I really only knew Stampede. Like I thought that was it. Like I, I was a kid. The world was really just what was around me at the time. And then we started getting um, WWF um, at the time, and it was just their Saturday like squash match show or whatever. Um, but I still thought Stampede was better, was way better. But then, like a lot of the top guys ended up going there, so which was pretty cool too. Um, so was that cool for you to, to watch that show and, and be familiar with the talent from watching them on Stampede? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, I remember when I saw um, Brett on there and then Dynamite Kid was on. Like, I would freak out. I, I remember freaking out, like, because I fully knew those guys. Um, so that was super cool. Um, and when I got into the business... When I started, so you, Stampede, you're watching as a kid. You're watching Stampede. You're watching WWF. And then, mm -hmm. when did you decide that's something that you well, wanted to do? So I had you just figure I'm not going to do hockey, so I'll, I'll go do wrestling. Well, and then we started getting. So each channel had uh, its own. It was Saturdays were awesome because we then we started getting another uh, company called All Star Wrestling out of Vancouver, which is kind of a lower, more lower level down. But that would be on one channel. The next hour we had Stampede. The next hour we had WWF. And then an hour after that we had Hockey Night Canada. So, I mean, my Saturdays were set. It's the only time I really watched TV was on Saturday. So, I came up with this plan. Like, I really, it's weird. Like, I'm probably like the only guy that I know that never had any aspiration to go to WWF. So, my whole goal was Stampede Wrestling. I want to go to Stampede Wrestling because those guys are making millions and wrestling, you know. And um, so I, but I, I kept watching it. And then I noticed like All Star was below that. So my idea was I'm going to start, I'll start with All Star because it's like the minors and work my way up. Because I, I don't know, you know, you don't know the difference at that age. Um, but I didn't end up going to All Star. I started with Stampede. Like I once I went to their camp or whatever. Like I tried to get in there at one point. I think I was 14, but I, I was already six feet tall and like 175. 
I was pretty big wow. for my age. I didn't really grow much in height. I grew like an inch since I was like 12. But um, so I tried to get in with them then, and they actually told me I was too young. So I waited another couple of years, hit the weight, put on a little more more weight, and then then got in there. So went to their camp. My camp had 16 or 17 guys in it when we started. It was a two month long camp, and I was the only one left at the end. Oh wow! So yeah, every it was really tough. Um, they really, it, it's. I've noticed wrestling. A lot of wrestling schools are different now than they used to be. Um, with the territories back in the day, when they started doing wrestling camps, um, they really tried to get people to quit. It was kind of almost like marine training where they break you down. And then they wanted you to quit because they only want the best, I guess, the best ones are the people who really want to be left. Um, and they just want to keep your money. So if they, if you quit and they, you get, they get the money, you don't have to do anything. But I stayed the whole time. And nowadays I've noticed some of the wrestling schools are different. You pay monthly, those never ending. And they never want people to quit because people quit, they're not paying their dues, right? So it's changed a little bit. They're they're not as 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 I guess as mean to people as they used to be, um, but it was really it was a it was a good growing experience and so you um, went through hell to get into Stampede. Oh yeah, it was brutal. The sole survivor. The sole survivor. There was one other guy that stayed that made it the same as me, um, but he had actually been hurt for like six weeks and he just sat and actually would show up to class and just sit and watch. So he technically made it too, but he didn't actually do anything. So um, he ended up having a couple matches, which um, were were uh, funny in their own right, because I kind of pulled some ribs with him or whatever. What Calgary was famous for ribs, so I've learned to rib pretty good too. When I I really chilled out on the ribbing though, but I had some good ones. Would we know any of the trainers from Stampede? Um, it was Keith Hart was training, and then um, actually after the after I went through my camp started, uh, I started helping out and then training with Keith um, on other camps. So Keith was the only one training you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then a um, couple of people, and then but there was also like some of the um, I guess bottom tier guys would come in once in a while and and train you and things like that when they wanted to get but we wouldn't know any of those guys no nah, they're like bottom guys but still at the time wrestling you know still out there but none of them are bigger but um later on when i uh got in got in with stampede and was then i'd go to train and there'd be like owen hart training dynamite kid there's like then you get some some name guys benoit like guys that were actually Legit. Were you on top so, of the world because you had grown up watching Stampede and now you were a part of it? So are you just thinking, oh, this is this is it. This I made it. Oh yeah, it was it was it was like crazy. But like I was, you know, the same thing. Thought like you know, keep you cool. And so I, from playing hockey, I kind of you know learned to you know don't show too much emotion. They act like they always, one thing I was always told when you went. I had a really good coach and he always used to say like when you score act like you do it all the time like it's not a big deal so I used to do that all the time um so when I was there I'd see these guys inside I'd be freaking out but then I was like hey how's it going and, and you're playing it cool talking. oh yeah playing is super cool and, and you're working with Owen Hart you're working with Chris Benoit you're working with some oh yeah great talent yeah and like when I started I did I either I it was, it was one of those things when you start, I would sell merchandise or referee. I would do anything I needed to do to get to be there. And then the first time I got to wrestle was somebody got hurt. So I had my gear, as always, bring your gear, kid. Always bring your gear. Uh, so I had my gear and I got in and then they were like, whoa, you did really good. Because I just, you know, just listen. Um, Never, I never tried to overstep any boundary, and I still try not to overstep any boundaries, you know. Um, but so I got in, and um, 
got to do some some matches and a couple of the vets that I worked with like me and like Ron Ritchie, he used to wrestle in the NWA, I think AWA too. Um, he was like the champion or one of the big guys there. I wrestled him and he uh, liked the match. So he requested to wrestle me a bunch of times and every time giving me like more and more stuff. And then eventually like lead up to, um, yeah, to kind of where I learn to get fire. And that's how you, you, you got to cherry pick from the veterans when you're in there and then um, ask them good questions or just watch. Like that's how I would just watch them, try to study them. But um, yeah, I used to have a lot of like kind of Bret Hart mannerisms a little bit in there that have kind of more, kind of more into my own thing now. But I noticed now when I look back at some old, old days, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I totally can see that. Do so you model yourself after Bret? A I kind of tried to, it was kind of a, a mixture of Brett and Dynamite Kid. I was a huge, and still am a huge Dynamite Kid mark. Um, like, I still do the snap suplexes and all that stuff. Like, um, he influenced a lot of people. Oh, yeah. I'm just not a uh, little like that anymore. But, like, uh, I, I still love it. I, I still watch a lot of that old stuff on YouTube. Um, but I always thought breast stuff was clean, like technically sound, you know, perfect, you know, so. It's the excellence um, of execution. The excellence of execution. Whereas like Dynamites was a little bit on the edge sometimes where it was almost borderline out of control maybe, but done perfectly, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I kind of like that. It gives it that real good realistic punch to it. That's awesome. So you're you're working at Stampede. You're having a good run. What working at Stampede. Next? Well, so I'm working at Stampede, and I'm working out with Tony Candelo. I don't know if you ever heard of famous Canadian promoter Tony Candelo. Does the Northern Death tours that everybody used to talk about, which I've done. I think five of them. Um, they are super scary. Um, so on those tours, you have to drive. You'll drive sometimes like. 27 hours or something crazy like that because the van can only do like four or five miles an hour because you're going over winter roads which is basically just a bulldozer just clears a lane where you can drive and it's like freezing cold outside so it's like if you break down you're dead you're in the middle of nowhere um you're driving over frozen lakes like i have seen where we'll drive and there'll be like semis halfway sticking out of this lake because it's caved in um, it's like super scary and you'll do all these drives and we, you're, you're basically wrestling on reservations, um, which are really cool. The, the, the crowd that comes out super dig the matches because they don't get in any entertainment there. Um, but they're into everything. The problem is if you get to them and the reservation has a death or anything like that, the reservation shut down for three or four days. So you'll get there and the show's canceled. Oh, wow. Um, so that yeah, happened to you, I'm guessing. Oh, all the time. Wow. Um, see, you <clears throat> there's no hotels. You sleep in the school or wherever we're wrestling, which is usually the school on those big blue mats. So you just get there and you basically just play floor hockey or play basketball because there's nothing to do, really. But, um, and those are bef the days before uh, cell phones and before any of that. So um, that was quite the tours. Um, they're very tough, but a lot of people go do them because it's just a, one of those things like, hey, I did, did a death tour. Um, or Northern Hell, they just called both. But, um, so I was with Stampede. One of the, the craziest things on, on, that happened to me is I was at home one time and uh, my phone rings and I pick it up and it's too hard. And right then and there, I'm crapping my pants because Stu Hart's on the phone with me, which is blowing my mind. Like, Was there a part of you that thought maybe it's Owen calling as Stu? Um, no, not at the time. <laughs> like, you know, and this is the thing. So Stu Hart called me like four times that day. I think it was like four or five times. Because every time he called, he had like, I don't know, 80 cats or something. So every time he called me, a cat would step on the, would hang up his phone. And so then he'd call <laughs> me back. 
And it took him forever to get to where he was going in the conversation. So he was talking, but I didn't care. I mean, I'm what, 17 or 18 years old or something like that. It was the summer. So I don't even think I turned 18 yet. Um, I can't, but I'm like, Stu Hart's on the phone. So anyway, Stu had called. WWF was doing a Canadian tour, like eight shows. And he was, he wanted to book me to wrestle on there against the Barbarian. Wow. Uh, which would have been huge. And to this day, I don't even know, like, wow, they totally picked me for that. It's like crazy. But then this is where I had a dilemma. I had just um, signed a contract or which I, you know, I thought was a, a big thing. And I was always told when you give your words, you have to try to, you know, stick with your word. Your word. And with, with this, smaller company that was running these, this little tour um which i wouldn't have you know not making any money the wbf would have been like actual pretty good money at the time i guess and it was wbf which was cool but then once again like i said i was never a huge huge part for it but um still it was awesome then i'm like it's on the same time as this tour which had already given my word i was going to go so I'm probably the only idiot out there that has turned down WWF to go to a small little wrestling company because I said I would do it. Hey, I respect that. <laughs> so I never got another chance to go back there for 12 or 14 years, I guess. Then I went and had you know, five, a cup of coffee there. <laughs> and that was about it there for a week or two. But, um, yeah, I Did you work back in matches like, or were you just booked? Oh, oh yeah, I work I work some some dark matches and stuff. Okay. I've uh been like the bridesmaid on like three different gimmicks that I was like the last one sort of cut before before that. I know I knew of a couple of them and then um there's a third one I just found out about like 10 years ago that I didn't know about that they wanted to tag me up with some guy from Minnesota. They said I was really high on their list. Um, they wanted to take this guy, so they booked this guy on like a three-show or four-show tryout thing because they wanted to tag him with me, and I guess he did really bad that after the second show or third show, they just dropped him, and then we were just, that was it. I didn't even know about that. Someone told me about it. I was like, oh, I wish I would have known. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, it was really, that was cool, though. So Everything you turned down that opportunity, good. and you stuck turned, with the bookings that you had. I turned down, I went and did the show that I said I was going to go do, or the shows I said I would go with. And the funny thing is, at the end of the day, the guy ripped me off. Oh, no. So I had signed with an agent, quote unquote, that he had sent out. So I was on Stampede Wrestling, and this, the guy came to try to take, like, book guys from, from those shows. And I wasn't always on the Stampede shows. Like I was, like I said, I would be there if they needed me or, 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 um, that's when I started to get good enough that I didn't have to go sell things. I could just, you know, be there, which was cool. But, um, so this guy came, I signed a contract, go to do the tour. And, um, the promoter and him got into a big argument and where he ended up quitting or getting fired or something. So I don't know. I stayed, did my, um, did my shows and then at the end he just paid me not even half of what I had quote unquote signed for which I actually signed a contract <laughs> and um I said well that's not what I signed for this is you know this is what I'm supposed to get and the, the, his only reaction to me was oh well he doesn't work here anymore and I was like oh but you know that was like you know what are you, what are you gonna do right so, I think so I you did the right thing at the time. It, it says something about yeah. who you are, your character, and that, of course, helps your reputation. So you're working at Stampede. You're working for these these hell tours. Um, working every Japan little show. It? Working every little show you can work in Western Canada. Um, <laughs> and Chris can tell you all about this. We'd have to drive 16. It's not like uh, you say Chris. So let everybody Jericho. know that's Chris Jericho. Sure. And you guys, you guys were traveling together during so this. The, see, 
everybody knows like Chris is he's the goat he's like one of the greatest of all time but it, we came up as youngsters so to me it's always you know sometimes I still think it's just Chris but he's the greatest did Jericho um, was with you while this was going on uh actually no he came in like four four or five years after me okay something like that but you know we can get into that so I'm so we're doing Stampede. I'm, we're doing like traveling every little tiny place you can get to. Vancouver is like um, a 13 or 14 hour drive. Winnipeg is a six, like 15 or 16 hour drive. Like everything's a drive out there. So it's not like if you're in Pennsylvania and you're like, oh, I got to go to a show and drive 40 minutes or whatever. It's like everything's like a long, long distance. So unless you can get like a tour, you drive, sometimes you drive 16 hours for one show, which I've done many, many times, um, just because you want it. You know, you get your time in, uh, get your face in. Nobody really sees you because there's, sometimes there's TV, but lots of times there's just shows. You know, you're just going there to do a show. And and uh, as you know, when you start in wrestling, you're not making big money. <laughs> You're not making big money by any means. So if you can get, but you're also getting that education, which a lot of people, that's, if they're newer to the business, it. It, it's a lot different now than it used to be in so many different ways. But back in the day, when you're on the road for 17 hours driving to a town and you're riding with vets and you're picking their brains and you guys are just talking mm. wrestling and you get so much exactly. education in, in the car, talking. So this, this is before you have cell phones and everyone's just so on their phone. Yeah. And you learn a ton of stuff. Um, I would just be quiet and listen to a lot of the stories. Or um, if I had certain things I'd want to ask, then I would ask that. Like, so I'm not like wasting their time or whatever or thinking anything. But you learn a lot. If it, a lot of the vets are really cool. Once they kind of back then too, it's a little different. Where um, guys would really they would talk your ear off once they were like respect you or bring you in their fold, which is a little different now where I know it's like in our dressing room, everybody's very, very team oriented, which is awesome. Um, like everybody's yeah, there to help different. each other. Oh, everybody I wants say, everybody to succeed. And Oh very, yeah. It's, and that, that's so great. Like that's the first thing I, when I was out. there, I was like, this is the best locker room I've ever seen in my life. You know, um, a lot of other places, it's always doggy dog, even different levels of the wrestling. It's like, it's, it's not like that. It's so, it's right. so good. You know, AW um, really is just a big team and everybody wants everybody to succeed. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. And it's from, from, I don't want to say every level, but you know what I mean? It's like from, from every guy from the bottom to the top, it's like everybody's still there together and nobody really. There's no like looking down on people or acting mean to anybody. It's 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 awesome, you know. And one thing uh, also like the talent in front of the screen is amazing. But uh, from the ring crew to the production crew, like those those people are amazing and super friendly and the best that they they they're the best out there. And I've actually been learning a lot from that side too. Like. Um, I've actually asked a lot of questions about things like that, just to learn that aspect. And I think it's been great what's answering about, all my questions. That's awesome. I think what's special about AEW is you have so many talented, the director, the executive producer, so many people in positions who are coming into this company, and it's not a company where you have somebody telling everybody how to do their job. It's mm. Tony Khan and the EVPs bringing in guys to do their jobs who they know are good at what they do and they're trusted to do what they do so it's like come and do your job and we'll just sit back and and watch what happens watch the magic mm -hmm. unfold and that's what happens and you look at like our director tim who's just so good we have so many cameras so many cameras at all different positions in the arena and tim just knows how to put that together and, and mm -hmm. make the production happen it's, it's neat yeah i it's it's amazing it really is. If you just stand back there and watch, it's it, it's overwhelming. It's really good. Uh, so, anyways, we're back. Let's let's go back in time again. Um, 
you want to talk about getting into Japan. So Japan was really weird too, because when I was wrestling in Canada, I was wrestling. I was a wrestler, you know, like everywhere. Um, it was cool because um, a lot of the guys around Stampede had like the old school tights too with the trunks and the stars. And the one thing that was really cool is my mom was a seamstress. So I had tons of gear, but like four pairs of boots. So I was always dressed good. So that always helped out too, getting booking. And when I started with Stampede too, Dynamite Kid was the booker and I learned, he gave me lots of good advice. He was super nice. I hear a lot of bad stuff about him too, but he was always super good with me. Um, so that's one thing I will remember to this day all the time. Um, I don't want to say he took me under my wing because it's not like I hung out with him or anything, but he was always really good with everything. And I, I respected him and it, and it was cool. So I learned a lot of, I learned from him how to like deal with, with, with people or like with rookies, I guess. And I've heard like, he's not good from other people. It was, he's not good with certain things like that. But with me, he was. So I, I took that in from that. But um, Later on, we're on these little shows. So Stampede folded after a while. And then there's a bunch of little companies that pop up like everywhere, you know, they come up and they last a while. But um, there was these promoters that would run. And I used to hear, I'm not one, I'm not good at bullshitting. Like I have this problem of trying to tell the truth all the time, I guess, or, you know, um, turning down WBF, you know, things like that, which is whatever. But, um, so I used to tell all the young guys when they'd come up, all these guys would feed them all this stuff. Like, you're going to go to Germany. You're going to get booked here. You're going to do this. And I'd be like, I fell for it when I came up. And then so when newer guys would come, I would tell them the truth. Like, hey, this is how it is. Um, that's not going to happen or this isn't going to happen. And I'm not trying to bring in your parade. I'm just trying to like, hey, just, you know, go with it. Maybe it will happen, but don't throw all your eggs in that basket. And so I got blackballed a little bit. So I was still working some companies, like that's when I had to drive a lot. You got blackballed for being honest in a time where you're supposed to work everybody. Yeah, exactly. Um, So the local guys blackballed me, but I knew I was was good enough. I still get bookings in like Vancouver, Winnipeg and stuff like that. but that's when Chris and Lance Storm had come through the camp, Chris Jericho and Lance Storm. And um, I'd see them around town. But they were told, like, don't talk to me because I'm, like, bad. I'm a bad guy to talk to. Um, He's honest. Guy Avoid him. <laughs> I guess. Great uh, shooter. But the, another guy that went was going to their camp came and talked to me one day. And we got along. And I just would – talk to him a little bit like at the time I was I was working at a gas station and trying to take bookings. I mean you still have to pay your bills right because wrestling you're not making any money you're doing it for the love and and to try to get out there so anyways I eventually did get booked on some shows because I I knew after a while they're going to need talent right so I they call me back so I get booked and then we're on a bus we were on this bus going to a show and I still didn't know these guys because they wouldn't really talk to me because they were told not to talk to me. Um, but I remember sitting on the bus, the bus broke down and I did a, I set a line for fast times at Ridge Mount High and Jericho knew the line. And, and then we started talking. So fast times at Ridge Mount High kind of brought us together and uh, we got along really good. And then we were friends out since then. And, and they got told all the same stuff and all the same things happened to like, happened to them so um in the end i got proved to be telling the truth um then going to japan they had gone over to fmw we all went to california to wrestle a little bit and uh we were doing a tour down to california and i ended up staying in california and they came back and um we had this i don't know if you want to call him an agent uh he was like a real piece of work um but they ended up going to japan for fmw and they were super green still like 
first, I think I want to say it's the first year in wrestling. Um, he'll know, uh, he'll know better than me, but uh, he, they were still really green. I think they did good. They just, I mean, FMW is like a hardcore company. See, and, and that was cutting edge because back then it was like 91 or 90 or something like that. There was really, I'd never really heard of hardcore. Like it wasn't a, wasn't a thing. Um, so they were just wrestlers, just like I was a wrestler, like normal wrestling. And so they went over there. A, they're green. It's a hardcore company. I think they, they did their best and it were probably good. Just didn't really fit that mold at that time, which I've seen, and you've seen too, probably in, in, in the course of, of your career, really good, really, really, really good guys that just don't fit that certain time in whatever company, right? Like, oh yeah, many, for some reason, many of those you know, guys. Um, where they're probably the best one there, just didn't, just didn't fit. Um, and that happens. I mean, that's happened to me many times. That that happens, right? Um, so they got sent back and were told to go back, wrestle more in Canada, and then, and then they're gonna get brought back. So I remember about a year later, um, I was contemplating quitting wrestling at the time. Like I tried to quit a couple times. Oh, of course big loud car just go by so i've tried to quit a couple times um but it's tough i don't know have you ever tried to quit um i thought about it but i never actually did i just kept going i there was a time where i thought nothing's gonna happen i'm not gonna make it to the big leagues but i just yeah. i kept going because i loved working the indies so it wasn't like all right if i can't go there i'm gonna quit i still loved doing it even if it was gonna be just on a smaller level Oh, that's all. That's the same with me. But after a while, like it just, it just gets on you, and it, it's one of those things when it, when you're starting. It's like like I said, to get in any shows, you had to drive. Like to go do a show in Vancouver, I can't just go do it and then be home that night and go back to work tomorrow. I it takes me a day or a day and some to get there. Wrestling another day day or so. So it's like a three or four day trip for a show. Um. Which so it's hard to, to hold down like a normal job. It's tough to have a job because, I mean, you have to have that special job that will let you just go do that. Um, and, and, and you know with wrestling, too, a lot of times I tried to fill up my calendar ahead of time. But, you know, lots of times it's like, hey, you want to wrestle? Yeah, I could come out here in two days. Like, they give you, like, no notice. Um, and, and it's one of those things if, if a promoter calls you and, and, hey, I want you to wrestle tomorrow, if you say no to him one or two times, they're never going to call you again. Right. So it's like, oh, I got to go. Like, so it was tough to, to get any kind of jobs. And, I mean, you're young, too, which is, makes it tough to get jobs as well, you know. Um, good thing was when you're young, most of your jobs are, aren't, you know, like, CEO of a Fortune 500 company. So it's easy – Losing or quitting that job's not that big of a deal, but um, I so it was like I was starting to get a little disillusioned on it. Um, I still love wrestling. I love all the guys. Um, I love doing it. I just didn't like a lot of the politics or or not getting to not having a lot of shows because it's one of those things too. With like there wasn't a ton of companies. It was weird. You'd get a few companies come up at one time, so it was a lot, on, or there's none. It was really feast or famine. But I was still going. I was still sort of hanging out or still doing some. Um, so they called Chris. He was, they were sending, uh, F&W was sending an agent to kind of watch, come and watch them um, audition. It. So there's no shows going on at that time. So they had this, community center they had rented out or they had a ring set up excuse me and uh chris and lance were supposed to wrestle these two other guys and uh i was just gonna go to watch i was, I was just hanging out with chris we hung out all the time so i didn't bring any gear i didn't like i wasn't planning on wrestling at all so i just always went, bring uh, your gear well i was kind of done like i was gonna oh. Oh, you were done at this like, point. Okay. Yeah, I was like, yeah. You had given up. Kind of. Like, yeah, but I was like, Chris was like, hey, come come down to this thing. 
come and you know come and watch just like at first i even said no i didn't want to it's like ah like i don't know i gotta like wash my hair or something you know what i mean like were you worried about that, getting that itch again i don't know i think i was just like the the agent guy was kind of and just he was kind of at first too when we were there like you can't work here you can't like one of those telling you you can't do anything kind of guy uh and he was getting any any work anywhere so i was like uh but i went because chris wanted me to go you know so i went down there to watch uh one of the guys comes in he has crutches he did something to his ankle the day before or was screwed up or something was hurt on him he couldn't wrestle so they only had one guy so they're like hey will you will you wrestle with tag up with this guy and wrestle them and at first i was like i don't have gear and i don't really want to but um they're like well like please so i basically borrowed sweatpants from this greasy dude it was gross but i borrowed his sweatpants and then um Go go wrestled in sweatpants. Yeah, well there you go. And then I wrestled and I borrowed his boots, I think, or so I borrowed all his gear. Uh we went in and we had a match uh for this agent. It was weird, it was like an empty room with with our agent and then the FMW uh scout. Um and uh then the guy that was hurt. That was the only guys that were there. So we wrestle, we do all this, do all our thing. Um it was kind of weird. It, we were just performing for those guys. It was it was totally like being on the wrestling version of The Voice or something. But um, they did all their stuff. Um, I just did my my thing. I didn't have any kind of hardcore or anything. We just wrestled. I mean, I was wrestling as lush as Lenny a player at the time. It was so very as far from hardcore as you could get. Um, so at the end of the day, though, then the agent came up to me and I ended up getting offered a contract, um, which was really weird, really cool and really weird. But I was the only one and I wasn't even, I don't know. It was bizarre. You weren't even supposed to be a part of that. Yeah. So I was like, well, this is crazy. Um, because when we were training, we'd have all this All Japan and New Japan posters on the wall. And remember I said I wasn't really into WWF. I really just like Stampede, but my main thing I always wanted was Japan. Like I always thought, like Japanese wrestling and any kind of video tapes I used to get back in the day. Like that was where I where I wanted to go. But then after a while, that seemed like so far away. Like that's never like how how am I ever gonna get to that level at this point? So when I got offered that, I was just my mind is racing because this is Japan. Like, this is awesome. I didn't know what FMW was at the time. Like at the time, I only really knew all, like all Japan was the big one to me. But I was like, Oh, this is really cool. Um, and I didn't really know about hardcore stuff. Had no idea. But they said like something, they wanted something crazy, like crazy gimmick. So at the time, silence of the lambs had just come out or I think, and I thought that's really cool. So I kind of got a straight jacket and tried to get that. But, and then I mixed in a few other things. I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, Cause I'd never done it. Never even done it in Canada. Like nothing, like never tried it at all. So I'm like, I have no idea how I'm, what kind of actions or how I'm going to act. So on the plane, I knew I was going to do the straight jacket and kind of like Silence of the Lambs, uh, Hannibal Lecter gimmick. Um, I couldn't use Lecter, so I went Luther. So I was Dr. Hannibal Luther. That was hmm. my full name. Yeah. And uh, so then uh, the, the, I was watching, he was, eating, he was eating Gilbert Grape, and I was watching uh, the Leonardo's mannerisms and stuff. And I was like, oh, those are, that's awesome. Um, so I kind of incorporated that, which I still use to this day a little bit. Um, and 
I came up with that on like as I was flying over there. You were so, the love child of Hannibal Lecter and Gilbert Grape. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, isn't that awesome? And so went out, had uh, my first matches. Um, it was really crazy because like you'd have like hundreds of thousands, like just tons of people around the bus when you're trying to get to the bus after the matches. And they were just all chanting my name, which is crazy. And then they, all the guys on the bus were just staring at me, and it was weird. And they're like, that's never happened before. Um, so it was like, wow, okay, that's surreal. That's really like cool. looking back now, uh, being older, I, I, I would respect it more. At, at the time, I was still really young, like, I don't know, 22 or something like that. And I just didn't understand, you know, didn't understand. It was all a party. I was, you know, this is great. But, um, and then won the AWA championship on my fourth match there or something like that, something crazy, and, and probably the worst match ever in wrestling history. Um, it was against a kickboxer who didn't know how to work at all. So it was, I mean, it was it And was he was rough. the defending champion? Yeah. Um, I really, I literally, it was, he would just kick the hell out of you. Uh, didn't know how to work. Um, so you just go in there and it was basically almost a shoot and it you know so I literally just wrap choked him out like right away I know in uh like a year and that's how you won the match oh yeah that's how I won the match you weren't even supposed to win but you choked him out and won it oh no I was I was (laughs) but I was just like this is brutal so it was it was I think I took it on really early I know the match when I was gonna supposed to drop it um, like a, a year later or whatever was against him and the next day when I left my whole leg was just black and blue like he, I thought he broke my leg like this guy was he's like a kickboxer he didn't know how to work um, it was brutal yeah but how was, long yeah. did you end up staying in Japan uh, total uh, like 10 years 10 years and you worked yeah. with like everybody and right that you just did crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. Onita, Onita, uh, Onida, Sergeant Kyoto, Great Kabuki, uh, Tenru, um, Mr. Danger. I think I was just talking earlier about Mr. Danger. Like, you, you name it, Hayabusa. That was one of my big things. I mean, everybody knows Hayabusa. So he was a young boy when I was in uh, FMW. And I used to wrestle him quite a bit. Uh, opening rounds when he was he was just a young boy so but he was so good so then we went to Cork and Hall which is my one of my favorite places ever to wrestle at I was like you know to me it was like Madison Square Gardens you know and um that's a really neat venue uh, neat oh, venue so awesome. and the audience I mean the fans are awesome oh digging it right so I remember going out there and um it used to be when you wrestle the young boy you know they get a drop kick in or something you know you just beat them up basically but he was so good and so much potential and um I used to talk to none of the I don't think none of the other foreign guys would talk to any of the young boys or girls but I used to all the time like I thought there was, I went karaoke singing with them one time which I don't know if I, I don't think I was supposed to but I did um did you have a go-to song was that did you have a go-to karaoke song uh well you know when you're like later on a couple times uh, me and Chris and some of the guys would go to karaoke rooms that had like 30 or 40 American songs or English songs. But I remember when I went with them, they only had like six English songs in this book. So I think I did some uh, Elvis song and a Beatles song or something. Probably <laughs> yesterday. Yesterday was always on there. So I think I sang that. Um, but it was really cool. So we go in and I actually gave him a ton of stuff. Like we had a match. Like uh, and Meltzer was there and, and said we were a match of the night and we were just supposed to be like a prelim match um and i remember we we it felt really good. it was one of those matches that when you come back you're like that felt good you know what i mean it just feels really good like um and then i got told to come into the back office for a minute which i'd never been told that like the whole time i was there i think i've only spoken to anita like two or three times like barely ever spoke to the guy. Wrestled them a bunch. Never really spoke to them. So I come in the back and they're like, "Oh, they want to talk to you." And I was like, 
oh, that's not good. Like, I don't like getting in trouble, right? So I go in the back and they're like, oh, that was, a, you know, in their broken English, that was a good match, uh, but you gave him too much. You only supposed to give him. And I was like, but he's really good. And they're like, he's a young boy. And I think he was standing there and just looking down. I can't remember now, but um, like he got in trouble for doing for doing it and I was like well don't and I was like don't give him trouble like I I told him I told him what to do but um that was it I didn't get in too much like that was all the trouble I got was don't do that again and I was like all right so next time I wrestled him I did he just got to do a drop kick and you know miss a moose hole. but it was like <laughs> back back to the same same old but uh, when I first got there though like I'd never done hardcore, so I just watched the match. I remember the first two shows we had. Um, I just watched, and and I one thing I'm able to do in my career is kind of like a lot of people are, used to tell me I'm kind of chameleonish. Like I'll I can learn what I'm supposed to do very fast, or like just watching. Like okay, I got to do that, or I got to do this, or this is the style here. Um, I'll still bring my own style to it. But um, so I, I watched that, and so I was like, "Okay, this is what we got to do." And there'd be a lot of guys used to come over from Florida or Memphis or wherever, or even Canada, um, that would last like a tour. Sometimes not even a whole tour; they'd leave halfway through because it was just too intense, like or like too hardcore, too way too stiff. But I was like, "Oh, that's cool." Like I was good with it; it's not a big deal. Um, you were good. You had a hell of a run out there. How did you get to AEW? So to AEW, um, I'm still. Did you take a break at some point and and drop out of the business? Were you still working? Well, I was working. the The thing that I find funny is, like, on my Wikipedia, which I didn't write. I don't know who wrote it. Half the thing is wrong. Most of it's wrong. In fact, they had my name spelt wrong on there. That my own mom tried to go on there and and change it and the guy changed it back and they got into some argument saying no this is how it's done and she's like I, I think I would know how to spell his name but whatever so all that stuff's wrong um so it says I was semi-retired but I was still wrestling weekends like still doing indie shows on the west coast um so you know isn't that what everybody's doing so does it technically mean everybody's semi-retired at that point right. like no, I was still doing shows the same as everybody. So anyways. You were still so active. Still, yeah, still active and doing stuff. Um, I quit here or there, little bits, but not really quit. Just, you know, time off. Like I had been, was back and I tore my triceps really bad where I needed to get surgery. So I was out for this last, so I was out for a year um, rehabbing from that. So I guess I quit for a year because of my arm, but I don't really call that quitting but um so I was back and then um Chris had called and said they needed a audition tape or like I just you know they're looking for something uh, I'm not, I don't know how much I want to get into about all that but anyways I sent in some audition tapes of some interviews and uh actually everyone's like oh you got you got handed stuff or you got this or you got that no I sent in like three audition tapes, had to go do a screen test, had to do like all, like lots of hoops, lots of trying and um, yeah, I was still there kicking and I got a new t-shirt, like things are rolling. That's awesome. Let's see, you're wearing that t-shirt now, right? Yes, sir. ShopAEW.com, cool. get all your merchandise, get your Dr. Luther, the original death dealer, the ODD of the AE dub. So you uh, worked all over, you worked Canada, you worked Japan, you uh, enjoyed everything you did. South and Africa now you got is to the come. very first ever barbed wire death match in South Africa in history, in front of like 30,000 people. It was crazy. Wow. Um, and down there was, they had no idea about, uh, it was legit to them. Everything's legit. Um, so I would have cans crushed up, chucked at me. Like you get cut, guys get cut, stabbed for like 27 stitches from audio. It was, it got to be where you had to walk underneath this little, little awning or bridge area. 
and they would be hitting you with canes and sticks and throwing things at you. So as I would leave, I'd have to grab like a chair and hold it over my head and I would just hear like people would be like rabid down there. So I did like five you've, tours You've come there. from that world. Now you're in the world of AEW. Are you enjoying yeah. yourself? I'm enjoying it. It's been awesome. Um, like I said, once all this, like once we're back to normal, it's going to be back rocking. Um, all the guys and girls are still in there kicking ass every week. They're watching. Um, it's, it's been a fun ride and that it's just going to keep going. Um, that's going to take me actually into a question that came in from at M grace. What are your goals in AEW and what do you want to achieve to say mission accomplished? Uh, what are my goals to, well, I'm going to start a revolution, man. Uh, my goals are just to keep at it get the Luther gang. I got, you know, we're, we're small in numbers, but to start a revolution, you start small and you got a grassroots that man, um, build up my little fan base. Uh, and I, and I keep going like, really there's, you should never, the, the world, like don't such sites small ever, like go for, go for everything. Um, that's one good thing about being here is, I don't think they pigeonhole anybody like the world, the world is yours. If you want to take it, you take it. Right. Like, they don't bring you in to say, Hey, we just want to keep you down here. And there's this glass ceiling and you're meant to be here. They let everybody do their thing. And so many yeah. people are able to thrive because it's just natural. The audience decides who they want to get behind. Yep. And, and, uh, and that's what I think is fantastic. Like I said, everybody, it, everybody's there for each other. Um, lots of camaraderie and, and who knows where the world would take you and you know like it's like anything everything changes every day but just keep going my whole goal my whole goal here is just keep moving forward keep moving forward learn something every day learn something um, in 33 years like I forgot you forget stuff ask stuff ask Chris like you'll forget something and then someone will Either it'll, it'll fire in your brain or you'll see someone, you'll be like, oh, yeah. And then a couple more things will come back to you. Like, you, you know, you know how that is. It's just, yeah, for it's sure. Like, you don't realize that when you're younger, but then as you get older, it's like, oh, now I understand. Because it, as you get older, you just, you forget a lot because you had a lot going on and a lot of time goes by and you get older. Oh, yeah. You, you'll, <laughs> you'll I, forget forget. Little, I forget little moves or little cool things that I used to do. And, and cause I, I've learned like, you know, three new things and I forgot. And that was like, Oh yeah, that was awesome. So now that's back in the repertoire. So everyone will think it's new, but it's really old. Like the what's old. old is new. And it's, uh, true. it's good to see the new you here. And I'm glad we had this chance to catch up and um, we got to learn and more about you from you and not your Wikipedia I, page. And you're a, you're an awesome guy. I met you. So I remember sitting on the side, uh, watching Brandy's match and uh, keeping an eye on her and trying to get you to share a seat. I think it was with Frank or somebody was there. And I was like, in my brain, I was like, I wonder if I can get them both, both so they have to go one ass cheek aside on one seat. I think I accomplished that. <laughs> I do remember seeing you uncomfortably close. <laughs> so, Luther, it's good to, to see you. And, uh, I try to have fun. To have you. fun, my friend. It was great seeing you. Thanks for having me on. Um, and stay elite, stay golden, brother. Thank you. You too, Luther. Take care. Hey, it was great to talk to Dr. Luther. And now I'd like to introduce you to one of my friends from behind the scenes at AEW. We have such a great group of people that work behind the scenes. And as you know, I like to introduce you to them. And introducing at this time, please welcome one of our incredible makeup artists, Stella. Stella, are you there? What it do, Justin Roberts? I miss you. It's good you. to see you. It's good to see you. I don't see the ponytail, but that's okay. I comb my hair to look presentable today. Uh, I, I get my hair cut literally every week. Stacy, you do a great job, and I miss you too. Uh, every week I get it cut because it grows quickly, and it is, it is down to here. And I wear a ponytail around the house, but trying to be presentable here for uh, 
Thank you. Very I much. love the ponytail, as you know. Maybe I'll bring it back one of these days when it's just too long to, to stop. <laughs> Stella, you are one of our makeup artists. Everybody loves hanging out with you, everybody loves talking to you, and everybody loves getting their hair and makeup done by you because you're great. Introduce yourself, please. Tell us how you came to AEW. Where where do you come from in this world? <laughs> where do I come from? Uh, what's up, guys? I'm Stella Kay. I am a head makeup artist at All Elite Wrestling, and my background actually is in traditional, like mainstream celebrity makeup like red carpet special events i used to be the youngest makeup artist ever signed to um like a big celebrity agency at the time it was like the biggest celebrity agency in the world and i got to work with beyonce and tony braxton and a longtime client of mine was Alyssa milano we went to the super bowl every year together for like seven years you worked and, with Alyssa um, milano yeah yeah that is awesome uh if i could Hopefully nobody else hears this. Uh, I'll let you know. I used to read like the the Teen Beat and those those magazines uh, from back in the day that had all like the the '80s stars in it. And in the last couple of pages, they had like addresses for your favorite celebrities, and you could write like fan mail. And I liked Alyssa Milano from Who's the Boss, and uh, I sent her a letter. And I remember like I was probably like eight years old, and I like sprayed it with cologne and wrote a whole and uh, never heard back from her, but, uh, Justin, I'm going to tell her that is so wholesome. It's all good. It's, so it's all good. She, she didn't write back, but I'm sure she probably got a couple of those letters. Maybe, two, <laughs> yeah, maybe a, maybe a few. Um, but you got to work with Alyssa Milano. You worked the Super Bowls with her. Yeah. Yeah. We went to the Super Bowl together for a while. I don't know exactly how many years, but there was a consecutive amount of years that I went to Super Bowl with her. And I just happened to uh, run into some wrestlers at the Super Bowl one year, and I kind of got swooped up into their world. And that's how I met Cody Rhodes and became friends with Cody and Brandy. And here I am at AEW now. That's awesome. How are you enjoying the wrestling world compared to the world that you came from? I love it uh, so much more. I've fallen in love with wrestling. I would say that wrestling is what keeps me in the makeup game. It's There's never a dull day. I could never lose interest. Like, like this is, I mean, I feel like I'm home. And you've like formed these friendships with everybody. I know you talk to everybody. Yeah, wrestling uh, is my family. <laughs> That's awesome. It's it's a different world. It's a it's a different breed. I always say, but yeah, we're uh, we're just a group of good people who are just interesting because everybody's really themselves. Everybody's I like to say quirky and kind of weird, and I think that's what makes it special. Nobody tries to hide it. Yeah, I think that's a little bit about what it is about for me. Um, I remember I was backstage with Sammy Guevara one time, and he looked around and he's like, "Look at all these carnies." They're all crazy, and then he was like, "You fit right in," and I was like, <laughs> "Yes, that like part of the craziness is what what it's all about." I love it. You do. You you fit in very well, and you love it. It loves you. You work with Janet. You work with Danny, uh, uh, Rebel. Um, there's a there's a whole team. How many people are on the team? We have one, two. Three. Three team members and two leads. So it's me and Janet running the department. And then we have Miranda, Danielle, and Rebel that rotate as the team. Well, you guys are a great team and you all do a wonderful job. Everybody comes out looking even better than when they sit down, which is saying something. Uh, I'm glad <laughs> that you had a chance really to fun. pop on here and, and say hi to everybody. And everybody gets to meet uh, one of our Wizards of Oz here. Is there anything you'd like to say to the AEW fan base watching? Um, I just want everyone to know that Justin Roberts looks really tan today. And if you ever get a chance to see him or comment to him, make sure that he knows that his tan looks incredible with or without me. Thank you so much. That's the nicest thing you've ever said right next to that <laughs> other time when you had told me that I don't look as tan as I normally do. I know, and you're tricking I turned my puff in a can of tan spray. I never forget that. It scarred me. Stella, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for popping on here. And Bye. Hope to see you soon. I miss you. Miss you so much. Bye. It is getting hot in this 100-degree Arizona sun, but it's uh, well worth it to sit out here and talk to Dr. Lutha and Stella, and I look forward to doing it again next week 
please let me know who you want to see. Um, thank you for being a friend, and thank you all for watching. Please stay safe. Please enjoy all of the AEW content out there, AEW Dark, AEW Dynamite, being the elite. Make sure to check out shopaew.com, Pro Wrestling Tees. I don't know if I'm forgetting, oh, the pre-show, the post-show, I think that covers it all. Thank you all so much, and uh, I appreciate you watching. Look forward to any feedback you send my way, and we'll see you again next week right here. Thank you.